Hello everyone and welcome back to another video tutorial on WebGL programming. This is tutorial number five and I believe this is going to be, if this isn't the last one, this is going to be um, one of the last ones that is an incremental tutorial, so, you know, one, two, three, four, five. The rest of them after this I'm going to try to do just more interesting topics that don't necessarily build off of each other. So this one is applying lighting in WebGL, and so the last thing that we did is we made something like this, where we had a model that we loaded it from a file, took all the information, got it over Ajax, uh, and it's just this smear of brown with you know the occasional shape to lend us a clue that it's a monkey. In video games, we have a lot more quality than that, so we're going to introduce lighting to give us something more like this. So now you can see the shape of it, you can tell the details, you can notice some um, that it's like a roughly roundish shape, and this one you can even see the detail of the individual polygons, which in a lot of games is an artistic choice that's really cool. In this one it's just because we're using a really low poly mesh. You could make a mesh that's much higher quality than this, and that's perhaps one of the things we're going to go into later, is uh, how to load much more elaborate models from file. Um, we're going to be using the Fong lighting model, but we're only going to be using part of it. We're going to be using the ambient and diffuse terms. And just to cover super quickly what all this is, is here's a Wikipedia page that is an excellent read on the Fong reading model. As you can see, it's like maybe two pages worth of reading. And there are three different types of lighting that it adds them all together to give you this nice good-looking image. In this case, it's just like a blob in the shape of an X that happens to be shiny. The first one is the ambient term, and this simulates light that's bouncing around the entire scene, and it, like, just kind of dimly illuminates the entire object equally. You also have diffuse light, which comes from what parts of the object are facing towards the light. As you can see, in this one, the light seems to be coming from the right side over here. Um, so you can see vertices on the, or faces on the far side of the object aren't lit at all with the, with the light, and vertices on the complete other close side are very nearly completely lit, and everything in the middle is a function of how tilted away from the light it is. You finally have the specular light, which gives you a lot of insight into where the light actually is in the scene. The specular light is, you can imagine, some light that has bounced directly from the light source onto the object and then back into your eye. It's the shiny spot that you see on shiny things. We are just going to be using ambient and diffuse for this video, though I intend to make another video later on specular lighting. So here is the lighting formula. I'm not going to get into it. You can read all this. Pretty much the important thing is ambient light. You just kind of multiply it by the ambient term. We're going to be using just the texture for the ambient color at that spot. And then you multiply the diffuse term, which we're also just going to be using the texture again for that value. And you multiply via dot product the normal vector. This is a vector that points directly out from the model at that pixel, fragment, vertex, whatever, uh, fragment in our case. Um, and you do a dot product of that onto the direction towards the light from that surface. So um, I brought up a little image right here. So imagine... Oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Okay, so imagine that we have a box down here, you know, it goes from like there, 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 and we're drawing a point on that box. And this is the normal vector that points straight away from the box. This vector represents from the box to the light, and this one happens to be pointing... Actually, this one is pointing in the correct direction. Um, so when you take a dot product, I'm not going to get too heavy into this, but if the light is perpendicular, so it's facing completely away, then you can see we have no light at all. I can't get it exactly perpendicular, but um, you would have zero light. But if it's pointing, you can see as I bring it around in a circle towards our normal vector, the value is increasing until we get perfectly lined up where it's maximized. At, in this case, 3 is how long this line is. And any, everything in between is some value in the middle. Now we are going to have to get rid of negative values because anything pointing away is negative, so we're just going to call these zero. That This has strength zero. It's not going to cause it to be less lit if a face is pointing away from a light source. I will put both of these links in the description. And let's see. I believe this one was... Yes, so this one is from my notes, which we don't need. 
great. And then this one was from the actual repository, I believe. Yes, so this one is serving from the actual repository. So let's get this going. So let me bring up my code right here. So the first thing we need to do is we need to grab the normals information from the model. Let me zoom in just a little bit. Right there is good. Now I can't remember exactly what the name is, so let's take a look at it. Model. I remember it was meshes zero is what has all of our information. And it looks like the normals information, yes, is just in a normals array right there. And you can see that there's just as many normals, in this case way too many, as there are vertices, meaning that for every vertex, which has three values in x, y, and z, we also have a normal, which is going to be an x, y, and z value. These ones are all going to be normalized vectors, so if you were to find the length of the vector, it would be 1. Um, so if it pointed straight in the y-axis, it would be 0, 1, 0, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the implications of that become a lot more clear if you study linear algebra, which I highly recommend if you're interested in game programming. Um, but when you take the dot product of two unit vectors, you're going to get a value between 0 or 1, which also happens to be the minimum to maximum intensity that we need for our colors. So it works out really nice. So let's follow kind of this same model that we've been doing for everything else. You can see we have position vertex buffer object, text record vertex buffer object, index buffer object. Let's make another one for our normal object. So Susan normal equals Susan model dot meshes zero dot normals. Yes. And then here after we do the index buffer object for Susan normal buffer object equals gl.create buffer, gl.bind buffer, we're going to use an array buffer, and we want to bind the normal buffer object, then we want to set the buffer data to gl.array buffer, now float32, same thing as we've been doing before, Susan normals, Susan normals, that one gl.static draw, because again, we're not changing any of these vertices once they are uploaded to the GPU. Great, so that's uploading that. So now let's actually add the attribute to our vertex shader. Attribute vec3 vert normal. And then we're going to add varying vec3 frag normal. And here I'm just going to say frag normal equals vert normal. <clears throat> now there's two different types of lighting. There's per vertex lighting where you figure out all the lighting information in the vertex shader and then you only pass the light intensity and light color to the fragment shader. Those values are then interpolated across the entire triangle to give you lighting values at every point. That is a lot more efficient but it's also much lower quality um, than the alternative, which is per fragment lighting, where you only pass the normal information to the fragment shader, and then using these normals, the fragment shader then does all of the work for lighting. On this particular mesh, it's actually going to be the exact same, and that's just because I know something about the mesh. I know that every face, every vertex, the normals are going to po be pointing in the same direction, directly outside of that face, without respect to the other values. When you're doing more complicated rounder shapes, cylinders, curves, that kind of thing, um, your artist will usually give you assets, or you will usually provide assets if you're good at art, like I am not. Um, you'll get assets that will have the normals kind of adjusted a little bit to look more natural when lighting is applied. So let's copy this normal over. Let's make sure everything, eh, we'll, we'll do that in just a second. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to ignore the fragment color for now, uh, the texel anyways, and I'm just going to grab the frag normal. And so I'm just going to color it with the normals to see what it looks like to make sure we're getting everything. So it looks like we're not getting everything. And the reason for that is I completely forgot that we need to bind the, um, the vertex attribute. So... Let's again follow this same model that we've been doing with all these before. Oops. Bind buffer, gl.array buffer, and we want the Susan normal buffer object. Var 
normal attrib location equals gl dot get attrib location program vert normal program get normal great sounds good and then gl dot vertex attrib pointer and I want this we want to be setting which vertex buffer object we're going to be or we're going to be setting the input for the vert normal attribute which we're getting from here each attribute L, each element in that attribute has three floats, so three gl.float. You know what, I'm actually going to put these up on the same line because they correspond to the same data. This is normalized information, so let's let's go over here. If we look at webgl vertex attrib pointer, I'm just going to look up something really quick in the documentation because I believe this gl.false is describing if it's normalized data or not. Values are normalized when access fixed to floating point. Okay, so I think this we'd be safe to say gl.true because the information is normalized, meaning it has a unit length of one. There are three elements and there's nothing else, so float32.bytes per element and zero for the offset. Finally, last thing is we need to enable the attribute, normal attribute location, and if we do that, okay, great. So now, this is um, what all of our normals look like, and it's very colorful because it's useful to visualize things like this sometimes. X corresponds to red, Y corresponds to green, Z corresponds to blue, so you can kind of get an idea for which way all the vertices are facing, like these bright red ones are facing straight in the X direction, the bright, bright zoo ones blue one straight in the z direction. However, you can see that that is all still in model space. That's not in our world space that we're interested in. So that's something we have to adjust in our vertex shader. Our frag normal equals vert normal right here. Our vertex normal is just going to be in the model space. We need to transform it to the world space. So we're going to do something very similar to what we're doing right here. Um, except for we're not going to apply the projection matrix because we want to keep it in world space. Our lighting information is also going to be in world space. So let's take care of M world times vert normal. Now M world is going to expect a four dimensional vector, I believe, so this shouldn't work yet. So we need to give it very similar to what we did down here, we need to give it a four dimensional vector. However, this one, and I believe I, I mentioned in an earlier video, I was going to explain the 1.0. When you're translating positions, this 1.0 takes in translation information into effect. So if you have an object in model space at 0, 0, 0, and you want that object translated three units up, um, you would apply a 0, 3, 0 translation to it. And this 1.0, the way the matrix, matrices are all laid out, enables that to happen. However, normals we don't want to translate, so I'm going to leave that as 0, 0.0. This, I believe, shouldn't work yet. We're not quite there, and the reason for that is frag normal is expecting a three-dimensional vector. This is going to give us a four-dimensional vector as a result. So I'm going to grab just the x, y, and z components of it, and that is a three-dimensional vector. Great. So now you can see the normals are all transformed. Um, and on the left side, we have the red. Up here, we have green. And then behind the monkey, we have blue. And so you can't exactly see it right now. Um, so let's reverse the z direction really quick just to show you 1 1 negative 1 let's make those point o's because uh opengl is actually pretty picky about type so great now you can see the things pointing straight at us are more blue cool um so anyways, so now that our normals are translated accordingly and the, they're pointing in the correct direction, let's start applying lighting information. And what we're going to need is we're going to need an ambient light, which for now I'm just going to make all of this information in the fragment shader main. So ambient light intensity equals vec3. Let's make it a very soft bluish light. Um, so 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And you know what, I might even actually change these to 0.1s and 0.2 instead. We'll see. 
this is I'm just picking numbers I have no good reason other than that those are small the next thing we're gonna want is we're going to want our sunlight intensity equals vec 3 and let's say that the sun is giving us a nice 0 0.7, 0 0.6, 0 0.3 light. So it's a yellow, whitish yellow light, I imagine. I don't know. I don't know what those colors actually mean. Um, and which way is the sunlight shining? So sunlight direction equals vec3. It is shining a little bit to the right, but mostly down. And nothing in the z-axis. Um, so for the direction, we're actually also going to want a normal vector, so normalize that to give us a normal unit vector. Um, and I suppose I should stop here to say that traditionally in video games, there are three different kinds of lights that we use. There's ambient light, which is, you can imagine that is just, if it's a bright day, there's high ambient light. If it's a dark room, there's low ambient light. So it's how much light is permeating the entire scene, including the shadows. You then have directional lights, which simulate a bright light coming from an object that's functionally infinitely far away. So imagine the sun. Um, it, the sun is pretty much infinity distance away for all of our purposes. It's much further than we're ever going to be able to calculate using our, float, or our scene arithmetic. Um, and then, So it's only shining, we only care really about which direction it's pointing, um, and then how brightly it is to our scene. There's also two other kinds of lights, which I'm not going to cover in this video, called point lights, which, um, or the first one is called a point light, and the point light has a location in space as well as an intensity and an attenuation, or how far it goes before it stops being bright. Um, and those, you can place anywhere in a scene and it affects ob objects diff differently. You can imagine that as like a light bulb or a lamp floating somewhere in a scene. Finally, you have a spotlight, which behaves like a street light or a flashlight, something where the light comes out in a narrow cone from a source. We're only going to be using directional and ambient light in this video, so let's make sure I didn't do any stupids and it still compiles. It still compiles. Great. So now we're going to be applying this and this. And because we are using only one light, so we don't have to do any summation, and the ambient light and the or the ambient material and diffuse material are going to be the same color. It's just going to be our texel. Let's grab that texel color. That is a vec4. Texel equals vec texture 2D sampler frag text cord. So this is just going to be grabbing the color that previously we were sending straight to GL frag color. And this is going to be both our KA and KD term. And because we're only using one light, and these are the same thing, our light intensity is just going to be our ambient light intensity plus this whole thing right here. So let's get that right now. So float light intensity equals... I don't want to float, do I? No, no I do not. I want a vec3 light intensity equals ambient light intensity plus... And then here we're going to put our sunlight intensity times the dot product of our frag normal and our sunlight direction. And I believe that's good. Now, this is going to give us a number between negative 1 and 1, depending on which way everything's facing. And we definitely don't want negative numbers, so I'm just going to do a max on 0.0, .0 so that the smallest it can be is 0. So now this will give us a number between 0 and 1. Great, so this might run. No, because we're still doing GL frag color equals all that. Hey, okay. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take that texel color that we have, and we're going to multiply it by our light intensity. And when you do a multiplication like this in OpenGL, in GLSL, it multiplies per component. So if we had 1, 2, 3 times 2, 2, 2, that would give us 2, 4, 6. So if we do that now, we get a compiler. Great. Line 18, so it's right here. Okay, it's expecting... Oh, okay, it's expecting a VEC4. And this is this right here, the texel color is a VEC4, but this is a VEC3. 
So what I'm going to do is I'm going to get the red, green, and blue components from that texel, multiply it by the light intensity, and then I'm just going to say whatever the alpha component of our texel is, that's what we're going to use as the alpha for this whole result. So now if I run it, great, so now we see our monkey is like kind of dimly lit from the bottom. So let's adjust these numbers a little bit, kind of get them lit better. So if I do 1.0, have it that, that looks like it's in the wrong direction, doesn't it? Let's make sure that it's negative direction we want it to shine. Yes, it is. So then apparently we want it to come from positive y. Yep. OK. Looks good. Something like that. That looks like a good direction. Let's also make our ambient light just a little bit brighter. So we'll say 2, 2, and 5, maybe. What does that give us? Okay, ah, so you can see his eyes are kind of blue because that ambient light is a very stark blue color. Um, let's make our sunlight a little bit stronger too. Why don't we do 0 0.9, 0 0.9, 0 0.9. Great, starting to look better. I'm not sure I dig the blue eyes, so I'm going to change that. I'm going to bring that ambient light back down to a very soft blue light. You know what? I'm not even going to make it blue at all. I'm just going to do that. Great. And so now you can definitely see there is much more of a lighting effect going on. Now there is one more thing I'm going to point out. In this example, it doesn't really hurt us, but the rasterization process tends to denormalize vectors. So I'm going to say um, that our vec3 surface normal equals normalize the fragment normal. So you shouldn't see any change, but I am going to point out that this is a good idea because this is likely no longer a normalized vector, especially in more complicated objects. Great, so let me just make sure that I've got everything in order. Yes, I do. Good, so this is looking good. So this is kind of the final result we wanted for this video. Hooray, great. But I do have a problem with the fact that I'm specifying all the lights inside of our shader. I don't like that. So we're going to work to specify them outside of the shader. Um, and I'm going to introduce a new concept here, because what we could do is we could just make all of these uniform values. And actually, you know what? Let's start with that. Let's make all those uniform. So uniform, ambient light intensity, uniform, sunlight intensity, uniform, sunlight direction. Oh, and I suppose I want a vec3 on all of those, huh? Great. Surface normal we do want to keep there. But I can get rid of all these now. I'm just going to comment that out. Should be black if I refresh it. Yes, it is. So let's go in our code right here to where we're getting all of our uniforms. And let's actually do all this after we do our rotation information. So lighting information. We'll make a new segment for it. I'm going to say var... Oh, well, for good practice, let's use the program program, just in case we change this code later to be using different programs. Let's say var ambient light intensity uniform location equals gl.get uniform location program. And I'm calling this one that. Let's make this a shorter variable name. Ambient light intensity UL for uniform location. Um, now, I do like to use the word uniform actually so that I can search over everything later when I need to change a whole bunch of things at once. Sunlight dir uniform location. And then var sunlight intensity uniform location. Great. So now let's actually set those values and for now let's just set them to the same thing we had before. So we will say gl dot oh I believe you say just uniform how many ever components are in it f and then I do want to set them individually, so we'll say V as well. 
ambient uniform location, and I wanted to set that to 0 0.2, 0 0.2, 0 0.2. Great, so if I were to refresh that now, it fails. No function of sound. Is it 3F? Just 3F then? Yep, apparently it was just 3F, because now you can see we have our ambient light. It's very dull, but it's there. So if I were to bring this up to 1.0 on all these components, you would see that it would just be the same thing that we had before. So this is our ambient component. Yes, and I like that. That looks pretty good. Very dull, very dim, but that's okay. Let's set our sunlight intensity and direction. So uniform 3F, sunlight, dir, sunlight, dir, uniform location. And we wanted that set to 3.0, 4.0, 4 and negative 2.0 but we wanted that normalized, which... So let's do this. Back... Back 3... Norm sun direction equals normalize sunlight direction. And then I want to use that in that computation. So now we can set that. As you can see, nothing's changed because we still haven't set the intensity. Uniform 3F sunlight int uniform location and I want the intensity to be 0.9 across the board. So now if I refresh it you can see we got the exact same thing that we had before. Looks great. Awesome. Cool. Um, so this is kind of the better practice. One thing I'm going to introduce is the idea of structs in GLSL. They behave pretty much the same way they do in C++. Um, though setting them is kind of wonky. So we're going to make one, but I'm also going to show that, at least at my knowledge of how to use them, they aren't that helpful anyways. So to define a struct, you define struct and then what you want the name of it to be. So this is going to be a directional light. We're putting that information together. And the components of a directional light are going to be the direction and the color. Great. So then in here, instead of saying uniform back 3 sunlight intensity and uniform back 3 sunlight direction we're just going to grab one uniform and it's going to be a directional light and I'm going to call it sun and then instead of using sunlight direction I'm going to say sun dot direction instead of saying sunlight intensity I'm going to say sun dot color and I think everything else it stays the same yeah, it does. Great, so now in here, these two uniforms no longer exist. They are both encapsulated in sun. So what we do is we say that the direction is going to be under, whoops, sun, what am I doing wrong? Why am I still in here? Why, what, 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 what did I do? Why can I not type in here? Okay, well, it's better now. It's going to be sun.direction. And this one is going to be sun.color. So as you can see, everything works the exact same. Nothing changed at all. If we misspell it, I can show that we actually did it right, that it's not complaining because we did everything properly. Um, so I like this personally just because it gives you kind of a more object-y approach. So I can use structs now. Um, and if I were writing something a little bit more elaborate, I could write a directional light class that then would take care of all these shading uniforms and taking care of all that stuff for me. Uh, so I didn't have to worry about setting these properties manually, because at this point, it just makes it a little bit more complicated. But say I had five directional lights in the scene, this might be a lot better to express. Um, so anyways, I really think that's all that I had for this tutorial, so... Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. If there's anything else you'd like to see about how to program in WebGL, let me know in the comments, and I will look at making a video about that. So here's our lovely rotating shaded monkey. Anyways, thanks for watching.